I do beg your pardon. I do very much beg your pardon. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Time is now fleeting, the moments are passing, passing from you and from me. Shadows are gathering, deathbeds are coming, coming for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are with Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon. Pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O oh sinner, Come home. As I said, I do beg your pardon. I do beg your pardon. You will be needing your authorized version of the scriptures. And when we get into the scriptures, please follow me along in the scriptures we will be looking at. I expect you to follow me along. And I will speak on to you as if you are, okay? <laughs> oh, been a rough couple of days for us here in the Avenshine household. <laughs> Very rough. A lot of trials, a lot of tribulations. Sometimes you feel like, well, we have felt like, oh, <laughs> anytime you want to take us home, Lord. <laughs> my, my beloved wife. Your sister, Church of the Living God. My, uh, my wife, my help meet, past couple of months has been going through just a horrendous, a horrendous amount of physical afflictions of late. For those of you who do not know, you, well, you may know, um, um, my wife is having, whether it's, Irritable bowel disease, 
there is such a thing, Crohn's disease or cancer in the intestines, my wife has been having some major problems. Uh, many of you have given many good um, uh, recommendations. Uh, I know there was someone who recommended soursop um, tea leaves or starts with a G or something. We got that and um, well, anyway, we don't really, things are not getting better for my wife in that regard. They're not getting worse, but they're not getting better at the time being. And that has been something that has been really, uh, really weighing heavy on my wife. Very much so. And um, also, the 21st of this very month, was also a very trying day for us. Um, September the 21st, my wife's right hip became dislocated. My wife has an artificial hip. She received an artificial hip uh, 19 years ago in a car wreck that killed her second husband. And she got like slammed into the windshield or something like that. My wife's a very small woman and just destroyed her hip, so she has an artificial hip. And on September the 21st, my wife's hip uh, of 19 years, the artificial one, came out of, uh, out of place, got dislocated. And that's the first time that has happened in uh, 19 years. And when people get artificial hips, these Jesuit doctors say they're good for about 10 years. My wife went 19. All the while um, in the past, working, bending over, doing things, you know, like any normal person with a normal hip would do. But that was a trying day. And that was one of those moments where we had no choice. We had to go to an emergency room, unfortunately. Like I have said in previous videos, when there is no choice, for example, if someone's in a car wreck or someone falls and breaks their arm, stitches or nothing. Okay, I could do stitches. Okay, I would be a little weary, uh, leery about doing them, but the reality is, you know, any one of us can do stitches, but not anyone can properly set a bone. Okay, stuff like that. Um, and also for uh, dislocated limbs. Oh, yeah, sure. I could have gone ahead and thrown a leg lock on my wife and, ah, you know, arched, arced my back and yanked it. Yeah. Yeah, I, but see, there again, I don't know what I was doing. I don't know what I'm doing with that. Um, and plus, if I would have tried to, you know, I look, we looked up online on the 21st of September of that happening. And um, we looked at the Captain uh, Morgan method where you put their, the person's knee or on, on your knee and then do one of these things. Um, but see, there again, I didn't know, I don't know what to do in those situations. We had no choice. We had no choice, but we had to go to an emergency room. And we talked with our brother, our, our brother, our best friend the whole way. And it was, it was a very traumatic thing. And my wife on that day, September 21st, was writhing in pain. She could not lift her leg that far off of the bed. And we got a wheelchair here and trying to get her to and fro in the car. And, oh, it was just a nightmare. But they finally got it in and we don't have insurance. And, oh, it was just a fiasco. It was a fiasco. But they got it in. Came home, gave her a, a brace to wear. And uh, in time, it healed up, we thought. And everything was going okay, except for the problems that my wife has uh, with her stomach and stuff. Then, one month to the day, the 21st of this month, at about 9.30ish or something like that in the evening, my wife calls to me, Brad, because I was still up, and she said to me, I think I dislocated my hip again. Really? <clears throat> and I had felt her hips, and uh, the previous time, 
it was the, the bulge on her right side was, I mean, looking at it, it was like, wow. And feeling it, it was, it was really out of whack. This time, it was a little different. My wife was nowhere near in any amount of pain as she was before, but it was dislocated. And again, the thing, and this, this, I'll confess this was my fault in a way because I never looked on how to do it ourselves, which is something now I am aware of. But we were like, oh, oh, wow, wow, one month. And that day on the 21st, my wife had said it had been a month today since her hip got dislocated. So we didn't know what to do. And again, I, I was not confident. I, I pr we prayed about it. It's like, Lord, what, what's going on? We can't, we can't do this. We can't, we, you know, we're <laughs> with my wife going to the emergency room the one time. And now this time it's like, oh God, my father, our Lord Jesus Christ, what do we do? You know, and, and I was like, do I do something? <laughs> because see, if I tried to do it, I could make it worse. And these, these, are the, these are the professionals, apparently. So we prayed about it, and the Lord was like, go to the Woodstock Hospital. Okay. We prayed about it. And we waited a little while, because we, you know, we didn't want to do anything rashly. Plus, we don't have insurance. <laughs> anyway... So get her into the wheelchair. We get her to the Woodstock um, emergency room. We went to the one in McHenry beforehand, which was just insane. Insane. Oh, boy, they gave us a hassle. Oh, But we went to the Woodstock one. And we get there. It was around 1030-ish or something. There was nobody there. Nobody there. And we go up there, and she's in the wheelchair, and we tell her, it's like, hey, this happened, and we had paperwork from the last month ago. We gave it to the lady, and it's like, okay. No one was there. So we got in right away. We got in right away. We went to the uh, one room, and then we called our best friend, our, our beloved brother. Um, and incidentally, blessed are ye if you have, whether you are man or woman, if you have a friend whom you can call at any given moment, at any given time, and that you have a friend who can call you at any given moment, at every, any given time, you are a blessed man or woman if you have such a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. As we have our best friend, and as our best friend has in us, it's something very special when you have a friend like that. But... We get in there and we call our best friend and we start, uh, we pray. We did a lot of praying. But during the whole uh, incident, now number one, most importantly, we went in there unmasked, of course. And um, they never said anything. Not one thing. Not one thing. Granted, there was nobody else there. <laughs> there was no one else there. It just us and uh, about eight doctors and including nurses and whatnot. But um, they never said one thing to us about the mask. Not one thing. Filled out some quick paperwork. They asked if you if we were vaccinated. It's like, of course not. And she's like, oh, whatever. Nothing became of it. But they took us into the back and we were praying and singing hymns out loud. And when we talked, uh, called our best friend on the phone, we had him on speakerphone and whatnot. And we were, we were praying out loud. You know, who, who cares who were listening? And um, they got her in an x-ray and then they looked and they saw, I was like, well, yeah, your wife's hip is out of place again. And it's like, oh, well, no kidding, genius. So they moved her into one place. But before they moved her, we called our, we called our best friend again and we all prayed together. Uh, while he was on speakerphone and while they were waiting for us, for us to uh, pray unto our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Chance to witness. So they get us into another room. They get my wife onto a lower bed 
and um, they then then they put something up her nose like these oxygen things, and then they give her a thing called um, oh uh, a twi a twilight <laughs> a twilight drug or whatever to kind of make her a little loopy so she wouldn't feel anything right. And before they did all of this, the doctor who came in. Um, we chatted a little bit, and before he went to go do so to uh, uh, to my wife, I said, I went up to him, and I was like, I uh, hope you don't mind, and he looks at me, and I put my hand on him, and it's like, Lord, uh, please guide this man's hands, please be with his hands that um, he can put my wife's hip back in place, please be here with these people, you know. Prayed unto the Lord. Asked the Lord to guide this man. I didn't know if he was saved or lost. Kind of reckoning he was lost, but just whatever. It's like, Lord, please let this happen. And uh, one, of the, one of the male nurses came by and joined us in that prayer. Okay? Very interesting. Very, very interesting. And see, the whole thing was why we were so adamant in prayer and um, whatnot was because if they could not have put my wife's hip back into place, then it would have meant surgery. And we are, we're wondering right now if my wife's t nearly 20-year-old hip needs to be replaced. <laughs> oh. But if they couldn't have put her hip back in, we would have had to, uh, they would have had to move her to one of these other hospitals where they keep people overnight so that they could have surgery. We, we couldn't have that happen. And we were praying to the Lord about that. And um, so, like I said, I prayed for the doctor. One of the male nurses came and joined us in the prayer, uh, joined me while I was praying for this doctor and for them. It's like, hey, Lord. <laughs> and then um, they do the drug thing to her. And then I get into the corner and I'm praying um, onto our Lord in front of all these people. I, I didn't care. Okay. Didn't care. You know, absolute suffering reveals and absolute suffering reveals absolutely. Okay. You know, you've heard people say in a, in a pinch or something, well, let's pray about it. Yeah. Let's pray about it right then and there. Who cares? Who's looking? Okay. Who cares? Needless to say, they got my wife's hip back in just like that. It took less than 30 seconds. And um, and then, you know, we were able to go home about 1.30 in the morning. Uh, so we spent about three hours there. But um, when we got home, we realized that, wow, the Lord used that whole situation for witness onto those people in that emergency room. Because like I said, we were, we were not quiet. <laughs> we were praying out loud unto our Lord. Our, our best friend, our brother, was with us praying unto our Lord. Prayed for the doctor. You know, hey, you know, Lord, please. <laughs> you know, don't know if this guy belongs to you or not. Help this man to do what he's got to do. Be here, Lord. And we don't know what kind of what that did. Or how the Lord is going to use that incident. And that's the point. Through all of the stuff that my wife has been going through, the Lord has been using that as a means to witness unto others. On that same day, my wife's son came by. And uh, we had a chance to witness unto him. Uh, I like I like my wife's son. I like him. Uh, I do, I do. Fine host, fine host. And we were able to witness to him too, and um, praise the Lord. But that whole day, which turned out to be the twenty second, because like I said, it was one month, uh, the twenty first, and then we went there, and then it turned into the twenty second, obviously. So the twenty second, <laughs> the twenty first, and the twenty second, through my wife's misery. The Lord turned it into something to be a witness not only onto the, what, eight people in that emergency room, and also on the 22nd, the same day virtually, unto her son. So our Lord can use any circumstance 
whether you think it be good or evil. Get your authorized version of the scriptures. Turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. Not Thessalonians. Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 12, on to verse 20 to start. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12, on to verse 20 to start. But I would ye, but I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now hold on. Paul was a, was a prisoner. He was bound. But the word of God is not bound. And through that affliction, whatever he was in, in the palace and all other places, the Lord through him was giving testimony unto himself. The Lord was testifying unto himself through Paul to what he was going through. Let's continue this. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. Envy and strife. Verse 16. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Picture a courtroom. Okay? And a lawyer speaking on to the judge, the tenets, the doctrines, the true tenets and doctrines of the faith, of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? What it is to be of the church of the living God, okay? Someone stating fact about what it is to be of the church of the living God as a means to shoo onto the judge that, hey, this is what this guy believes, this is what he teaches and preaches, telling that using the truth as a means to attack the one who is preaching the truth, okay? This differs from those who preach another Jesus, okay? The context here, verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. Verse 16, the one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Now what he's talking about is people were telling whoever it was, the magistrate or whatever, the true faith, this, the people were actually witnessing of what Paul preached and believed, which is the truth. They were preaching uh, the truth not sincerely, trying to use it as a means to get Paul in trouble for what he believed. This differs totally from someone today like these Jesuit coadjutor scum preaching another Jesus, a false gospel. No, the context is someone... Uh, speaking of the true gospel, uh, trying to add affliction onto the bond, uh, affliction and bonds onto the one who is bound. See, it's a difference. It's not talking about those who preach another Jesus. You you realize there are some out there who will actually preach or speak the true gospel as a means to afflict the one who is preaching it, to make you look bad. Have you ever thought of that? Let's continue. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? See verse 18. Notwithstanding in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Now, see, think about this in context. Was Paul rejoicing that someone might have been preaching an easy believism, 
false gospel, another Jesus, or the love gospel, Jesus, who judges nobody? Would Paul be rejoicing that someone was preaching a false Jesus? No. No. Give me a break. And if you say that, you, you need to examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Okay? No, Paul was not ex being, you know, rejoicing in that someone was preaching a false Jesus. No. No. What he was rejoicing was the Jesus in whom he preached, who is the one of the scriptures, our God, our Father, was being preached by one who sought to lay more affliction on Paul, speaking the truth as a means of an attack, while the other of love, who most likely was of the church of the living God. See, it wasn't that two Jesuses were being preached. No, the one Jesus, the one Jesus of the scriptures, our God, our Father, was being preached. One was doing it in pretense, trying to uh, use it as a weapon. The other one in love. See, it wasn't that two Jesuses were being preached. Understand that, okay? Understand that. Okay, because also remember in the book of Romans, where it says, uh, says uh, I believe it's Romans chapter 2, where, or two or, no, it's uh, Romans chapter 2. But if the truth hath abounded more through my lie, why then am I also judged a sinner? So would Paul be rejoicing again if someone were preaching another Jesus than what he pro uh, preached? Blip! Okay? You get that? Okay. So, verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 8 on to verse 18. Remember. You know, when you go out, when you are doing what we are to do as the Church of the Living God, uh, doing works, good works, after salvation, not to save ourselves or to stay saved. No, but we are called on to good works, to be ambassadors. Um, you might be thinking about, like, well, I'm not seeing any fruit. Or you might be thinking that you're not being productive. But see, God can orchestrate any kind of circumstance to use you to be a witness unto him. That's why we went through that whole thing about what happened with my, my wife recently. Okay? Check this out. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 on to verse 18. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because we are supposed to be dead unto that. And the more you resist that through our Lord Jesus Christ, that's going to kill your body. <laughs> You know, where sin resides, in the flesh. Okay? Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. The life of Jesus might be manifest in our body. Living through the scriptures, living our life as the example that is given to us in scripture, okay? Living according to the scriptures, living by faith, not by sight. 
For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Hold your place right there and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 9 and 10. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Verse 11 in uh, chapter 4. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, putting you into what seems impossible situations. And through those impossible... See, there, there's this erroneous idea that God will not give you more than you can handle. Boop! That is the... That is a... Uh, <laughs> see, that's what these Christians teach you in these church buildings. These Christians. God won't give you more than you can handle. Shut up! Who do you think you are? No. God will give you far more than you can handle. Why? That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. How can you be so happy with all this stuff going around you? How can you have such joy? How can you have such hope? How can you have such hope knowing that the Jesuits through Kamala Harris through uh, Smoking Joe are now making it uh, something about if you got 600 bucks in your bank, there you can the IRS can uh, spy on you, trying to get rid of the middle class. More on that in another video, but you know, never mind that. But how can you be calm? How can you have hope? How can you have faith? How can you rejoice in such times? How can you in an emergency room, surrounded by people who are working for the Jesuit order, how can you have faith? How can you um, rejoice, sing hymns? See? Who knows what those people went home with that night? Who knows? Who knows how the Lord is going to uh, use that? You get the point? Verse 12. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God. Look at verse 15 there. Okay, look at that verse. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God. You know, after that doctor got my wife's hip back into place and he called me over to the desk, uh, like I said, no mask. <laughs> and uh, he showed me the x-rays, which were, oh, oh, pretty horrific. Um, and I, I, again, I said, I'm like, praise the Lord, you know, thank the Lord that this, you know, that you were able to do, the, do this. And he said to me, quote, it was the blessing that you prayed that ha made it happen. Coming from someone who I don't know whether he was saved or lost, I don't know. See? There can be things that God could put you into, a circumstance, a situation, where when you exhibit faith, trust, 
and others around you see it. Not doing it of eye service like the Pharisees who, uh, who made long prayers in public so to be seen, seen of men. Verily, they have their reward. No, 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 no. Brethren, listen to me. You're going to reach a point in your walk when you're just not going to give a rat's rear end who's looking at you when you get on your knees and start praying and giving thanks unto the Lord. You will reach a point like that. And if you are right now, you, you babes and whatnot, but if you're at the point where you're just like, I'm, you know, in front of a lot of people, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed. Be careful with that. But then again, you got to be careful because there are those who will do that to make a shoe in the flesh. But more rather, the longer you walk with our Lord, the more that you go through, the more patience you get. You're just going to reach a point where you don't care. <laughs> Who cares? You know, let's pray about it. Okay, bow, bow your head. Brad, we're, so what? Come on. You said, let's pray about it. Who cares who's listening? Who cares who's watching? Okay? Who cares? Afraid to pray? Hmm? Well, you're, gonna, you're supposed to say no, right? What if the Lord would have you to pray to him in front of 50 people? Who knows how the Lord is going to use that? Who knows? But like I said, you got to remember, there's a difference between what the Pharisees would do, who would make long pretense, uh, long prayers to be seen of men. No. No, there's a difference. That, they get the applause of men, the oohs and the ahs. They get, they've received their reward. Okay? But you know, brother, sister... When you're in a situation when you, you just, <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times I've been out there. When I prayed, and I'm just like, I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care who's watching. I don't care who's looking. You know, when the, the situation warrants it, pray. When the situation warrants it, sing hymns. <laughs> My, our best friend. Um, the last time he was here, we were in a store. We had to get something. Some kids over there were talking about something that was blasphemous. Our best friend just started singing hymns. Just started singing hymns. Who cares? Uh, his name is Alexander, not Karen. <laughs> My name is Brad, not Karen. My wife's name is Sue, not Karen. Get it? But yeah, he started singing, um, singing a, a, a hymn right there. Because someone over there was blaspheming our Lord. And he just started singing. That's what I'm talking about. As, you know, if you love the praises of men, you're in a lot of trouble. But if you love our Lord, that's a different story. Let's continue. Verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For our light affliction. Oh, how many of you out there of the Church of the Living God have health issues right now. I know of many of you. These are light afflictions. Light afflictions, brethren. 
My wife, like I said, these past couple of months have just been brutal for her. But see, these are light afflictions in comparison to the eternal glory that she will have ruling and reigning alongside our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Light afflictions. That's why we as the Church of the Living God, we can rejoice. Why? Because this isn't permanent. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Again, where's your eye focused? Go to Hebrews chapter 11. A little instruction in righteousness here for us. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23, and on to verse 26. Talking about Moses, or Moshe. Moses. By faith. Uh, Hebrews 11, verses 23, on to verse 26. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than, that, than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense with the sea of the reward. Recompense, C is a noun, S is a verb. Okay? Look at verses 25 and 26. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. In verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense, noun, of the reward. See the, what does it say here? The treasures in Egypt. Egypt here, likened unto a type of this world. It is far better for you, church of the living God, to suffer reproach for the name of Christ, obviously, than to enjoy the treasures of Egypt. What is this? To enjoy, uh, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season? The thing about sin is it doesn't satisfy. You have to keep doing it, don't you? Don't you? While our Lord will satisfy you. It's better to be cast out for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ than to bow your neck to the world and its dictates. Far back. You know, you see, you know this, right? But is your knowing go from here down to the 18 inches and taking root there? And besides, who knows how the Lord is going to use you in any situation that he allows to happen for his glory? Because like I told you, my wife and I and our best friend, when we were in that emergency room, he was there on the cell phone with us, okay? We were praising the Lord. We were giving, we were making our Lord known without care who was there. Okay, because our eyes were focused upon our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. When your eyes are truly focused on the Lord, people, the 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 things on the side, you know you get uh, blinders on, narrow vision, tunnel vision, 
because narrow is the way that leads to life, while broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. See, when your eye is focused on the Lord, this, this stuff, your peripherals, kind of lose, get a little hazy while you got your eyes on the Lord. See, and That's the point that I'm trying to drive home to you. Those of you, you're Christian, right? And you gave in to the dictates. Why? Why? You don't trust the Lord? Hmm? Don't trust what, that He can provide for you? Are you living by faith? Or are you only living by faith by lip service? And when push comes to shove. Hmm. Absolute suffering reveals. And absolute suffering reveals. Absolutely. Like, I, like I've told you many times before. Um, I, I wish I could find this. where the, uh, It was a documentary on submarines. Guy said in a documentary about submarines. You want to get a guy to believe on God. Put him on a sinking submarine. Yeah. Now go to Psalm 86. Go to Psalm 86. Psalm 86. Can you handle this? Oh, excuse me. Psalm 84. <laughs> Psalm 84. Beg your pardon. Psalm 84. Again, can you handle this? Psalm 84. See, like I said, when your eye is focused on our Lord Jesus Christ, the peripherals get hazy. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee, Shelah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, not in Egypt, in whose heart are the ways of them. Who passing through the valley of Baca, make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. Going from strength to strength. Their own strength unto the strength of the Lord. Faith to faith. faith from faith to faith. Okay, From faith in what God will do unto faith for what God has done. Okay? O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Shelah. Behold, O God our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. Remember what we just looked at in Hebrews? For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of of wickedness. What is that blasphemous saying that I've heard before? Better to uh, reign in hell than to be second in heaven? I've actually heard people say that. Wow. <laughs> Good luck. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. How do you walk up uprightly today? By having wisdom and understanding. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. A lot of people can depart from evil, but not, a lot, not everybody fears the Lord. <laughs> okay? 
and you up and walk uprightly today, we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith in what the Lord has done, meaning as far as our salvation. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. But see, remembering in Hebrews about the pleasures of sin for a season and uh, esteemed the reproach of Christ greater than all the treasures of Egypt and type. Egypt is the type of the world. Okay? Here's the contrast to that. Go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 unto verse 11. And again, again, excuse me. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 unto verse 11. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and sheweth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Hold your place right here and look in uh, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Okay, compare this. Compare scripture with scripture. Okay. Luke chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Go back to Matthew, picking up at verse 9. Or verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. See, the temptation will come in your affliction, whatever it is. Satan will come. It's like, I can make it stop for you. Worship me. Bow down to me. I'll make it stop. I'll make it go away. But no, when you keep your eye, like our Lord says here, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. When your eye, keep your eyes upon Jesus. <laughs> when your eye is upon our Lord Jesus Christ, like I said, the peripherals get hazy. But see, Satan will come up in any situation and try to tempt you. I can make it stop. I can make good things come from this. Worship me, and all will be thine. See, in temptation, Satan can be there to tempt you to sin, to alleviate what God wants you to go through for a witness and example unto himself. But Satan wants to come in there and ruin it and get your attention from off the Lord. you got to be careful of that. You really, really got to be careful of that, brethren. Now go back to first, uh, first, go back to Philippians. Now we will be reading verses 21 on to verse 30, okay? Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 on to verse 30. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. <laughs> See, Paul was in that strait. 
We all want to go home. And we as the Church of the Living God, we are in our Lord's hand. And our life is in His hand. And we ain't going to go unless the Lord allows it or unless the Lord calls us up. One of the two. Our times are in His hand. And while you are here, you are here. What are you doing? What are you doing? And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. You know, Christians have trivialized the... God has a plan for your life. He actually does. But see, these Christians have trivialized that. And when they say that to you, it is to give you this grandiose idea that you're going to be uh, used to call ten thousands onto Christ. Maybe that may be the case. Who knows? But see, when the Christian tells you God has a plan for your life, they use that to puff you up. To puff you up. Whereas, yes, God does have a plan for you. But how many take into consideration what we looked at in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4? That that plan for God for you might be putting you through the utmost hellacious horrendous sufferings that those who see it could see Christ in you. But see, when the Christians are telling you it, they, they, want, to, they want to implant into you that to make you something great. And, you know, that pride... When a Christian tells you, God has a plan for your life, he's telling you that in pride. Puffing you up. Yes, God does have a plan for you. But what if it's a plan of suffering? Hmm? Because guess what? We are called to suffer with our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? We are called to suffer. And then you get Satan coming along wanting to alleviate your suffering by following him, bowing down to him. Go to Jeremiah chapter 45. One of my utmost favoriteest chapters in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 45. Hopefully we can finish this chapter as long as we got. Okay? Hopefully we can get this chapter read. Jeremiah chapter 45. If you're there and you're looking at it, you'll see my sarcasm. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spake unto Baruch the son of Neriah, when he had written these words in a book at the mouth of Jeremiah, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto thee, O Baruch, Thou didst say, Woe is me now, for the Lord hath added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing. I find no rest. Don't look at me. Look at the scripture. Thou shalt say. Thus shalt thou say unto him. The Lord saith thus. Behold. That which I have built. Will I break down. And that which I have planted. I will pluck up. Even this whole land. For you my American countrymen. Keep this in your mind. Seeking to get rich now and all this stuff now. Uh, America's done for, Jack. America's done for. And then you got these Christians. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for your life. As to lift you up, to puff you up. Not to lift you up, but to puff you up in pride. And seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. For behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord. 
But thy life will I give unto thee for a prey in all places whither thou goest. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. And when you got these Christians today, putting into your minds to, to puff you up, that you might be some great one. Hey, 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 okay. Maybe, maybe the Lord will. But make you a great one. The Lord may use you to do some extraordinary things, but who's going to get the glory? When you got the Christians telling you God has a plan for your life, trying to puff you up with pride. You see what I'm saying? All will be thine if you fall down and worship me. And pride is directly traced unto the father of lies, Satan. Verse 26, verse 26 in Philippians chapter 1. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. <laughs> and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Um, <laughs> the more people attack you for preaching the truth of the gospel, can lead on to you more proof that, okay, I'm doing something right. You must be doing something right <laughs> if they're attacking you because of your stands for the gospel and for the scriptures. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Okay, if you're making the stands, if you're standing by faith according to the scriptures. And as it says, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition. Token meaning that they're lost going to hell. You know, like all these easy believers and heretics who like to attack the true gospel. Brokenness, contrition, fear of the Lord, calling upon the name of the Lord, being made a new creature. They're, they hate all of that. They're all just about believe and saving themselves. So they attack those of us who preach the true gospel. Okay? Verse 29. For unto you... It is given on, in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And see, the Christians kind of like to, like to skirt that a little bit. Or suffering might be, oh, I can't get my $50,000 truck into the repair shop. Oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? Why, oh God, are you putting me through this? You have another vehicle, right? Yes, I do. But my, my favorite truck with all the bells and whistles. Oh, shut up. You pretentious false convert. Verse 30. Having the same conflict which she saw in me, and now here to be in me, the suffering, the suffering. Go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 8, on to verse 19. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But... The word of God is not bound. It doesn't matter what circumstance or situation you are in. Whatever, whatever you're in, whatever capacity, whatever state you are in, the word of God is not bound. You always got the scriptures on you? Hmm? Doesn't matter the circumstance. 
God can use you for his glory. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes. The elect here is those who are of the church of the living God, not the heresy of Calvinism, okay? That they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And again, that denying us does not mean salvation. We're eternally secure. We're sealed onto the day of redemption. No, denying us a blessing, denying us something else other than our salvation, okay? That's what that's talking about, just, just so you know. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. Why? He cannot deny himself because we are of his bones and of his flesh, okay? We are the body of Christ. We are of Christ. We are not Christ. Well, God forbid. No, but we are of Christ. Hence, he cannot deny himself. See, you're saved, born again, converted, church of the living God, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Um, God is in you. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. You know, the Holy Ghost, Lord is that spirit. He lives within you. Hence, he is in you. You don't belong to yourself. He can't deny himself, see. Beg your pardon. Let's continue. Of these things, put them in remembrance, which I'm doing. Charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. Profit. But to the subverting of the hearers. Study. You're not using the authorized version? What does it say? Work hard. Be diligent. Do good. No. Study. Study to shew thyself approved unto God. A workman. You're called to do work after your salvation. Not to stay saved or to be saved. Okay? But you are called unto good works. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Scriptures. They're for you. But they're not all. It's not all written to you. This is a Jewish book. It's for you. It's for them. But see, not everything in it is written to you. All nine epistles, you know, from Roman on to Philemon, those are written for us specifically for this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles. But yet, as it saith in uh, uh, Romans chapter 15 about um, well let's look there Romans chapter 15 okay Romans chapter 15 verse 4 for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope and we're told here in verse 15 in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Dispensation. Ages. There are seven dispensations within the scriptures. Okay? You have to rightly divide that because doctrinally things are different within the dispensation. Salvation changes according to the dispensation you wicked heretics. It's not faith alone from Genesis on to Revelation. That is heresy. Okay? Today we are saved by grace through faith. Under the law, it was faith and works. The kingdom of heaven, it will be works. In the Garden of Eden, it was works. Okay? The uh, 
dispensation of the patriarchs, similar unto this dispensation, but not exact. Also a faith and works system. Okay? Similar. Similar to this, but also faith and works. Okay? Similar unto this. This dispensation by grace through faith. The time of Jacob's trouble, also faith and works. So salvation changes within the dispensation. And if you do not rightly divide the word of truth, you're going to get into all kinds of errors. And of course, uh, verse 16 in uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay? So, going back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 again. Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth the canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who, comes, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, because we are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So see, God will allow you to go through certain uh, circumstances and whatever they are. And if you are studying to show yourself approved unto God, God could put you in, will put you into a situation where he'll, you know, open up your head, your brain for a minute. It's like rem you'll remember that verse. He'll tell you this verse and you'll go from there. But then again, always have the scriptures on you. You never know how God is ever going to use you in a certain circumstance, whatever it is. And now go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 on to verse 17. We already looked at uh, this, but we'll read it again. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Out of them all the Lord delivered me. Sufferings, persecutions, afflictions, for standing for the word of God. And all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions never forget that but according to the Christians yeah yay and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution see this is the part that the Christians don't want to talk about with you God has a plan for your life God wants to bless you May, what if it's through suffering What if it's through homelessness? What if it's through death of everyone you love? What if it's through betrayal of those who you thought were of the church of the living God and turned out not to be? It doesn't matter the situation, brethren. God can use it for his glory. Is your eye focused on the Lord? Are you on a sinking submarine and Satan is there trying to tempt you to get away from going to the Lord? But evil men and seducers, yea, hath God said, seducers, just believe. Prayer is a work. Repentance is a work. Uh, repentance is going from unbelief to belief. 
I've encountered that outside my door. I almost bit the guy's head off. <laughs> Unfortunately, especially when I encountered it, mano y mano, got to have grace, got to have patience. Yes, you have to have charity. But that really waxes lean with me when I run into it personally. Belief is going from unbelief to belief. Shut up. <laughs> anyway. But evil men and seducers, God loves you. Don't judge. Hate the sin, not the sinner. Love those who hate the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. From a child, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. And it says within the book of Luke that he opened their understanding that they may understand the Scriptures. Who did you learn from? Rockman, right? <laughs> uh, then isn't the Lord the one who teaches you? Who taught you? Who taught you? A man? Or the Lord? And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Verses 3 under verse 5. See, whatever you're going through right now, whatever hardship you are going through, God can use that for his glory. And brethren, you really have to beware about taking the bait of Satan. You really have to be on guard about that. What if it is the Lord's will to put you through suffering that he may be glorified in the end? But see, the Christians don't want, want to hear that. They don't want to deal with that. My poor wife, like I've told you, has been through the past couple of months incredible suffering. But through that, the Lord has used her. The Lord has used those situations for witness and a testimony unto himself. But it came through suffering. Seek you great things for yourself, huh? Romans chapter 5, verses 300, verse 5. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh. Come on, come on, say it with me. Come on, come on, come on, say it with me. That tribulation worketh patience. And patience, experience. And experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. The verse that uh, talks about uh, the love of God is for those who have the Holy Ghost who are truly saved. Okay? But patience. Oh, patience. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. Neither am I. Neither am I. <laughs> and one of the most frightful things, two of the... Two of the most frightful things, and I speak from experience. Two of the most frightful things that a man can pray for are patience and humility. 
because experience has taught me personally, I pray for patience. Grinding <laughs> tribulation, affliction, grinding, horrific trials. This goes wrong, that goes wrong. We butt heads on this, this, that, and the other thing. And we're both like, what's going on? Did you pray for patience? I did. Ah! <laughs> Humility. When God answers the prayer of beloved brethren for humility, you know, gives you a thorn in the flesh, take the rug off from under you, make you eat some crow, put the dung on your face. Those are two of the, those are two of the uh, most courageous things to pray for. And those actually, in all honesty, are two of the things that our Lord seems to like to honor in prayer. Lord, give me patience and humility. Ooh. Ooh. Patience and humility. And through patience, you can learn humility. And through humility, also, <laughs> you can learn patience. See, patience and humility are like peas and carrots. First Thessalonians, chapter 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. Uh, it's, this is not talking about that satanic Calvinism. If I can remember, I will put the link for Calvinism refuting the elect and non-elect thing according to the scriptures. I'll put that in the uh, uh, in the description box. Okay. But knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word and much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Look at that verse. Look at that verse. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Everybody in that emergency room knew our faith on our Lord Jesus Christ. Not because we purposely did that, meaning to prove to them. No, we just didn't care. We, we had our minds and our eyes on Jesus. All three of us, because our best friend wasn't there physically, but was there in spirit and also to uh, the hell phone, okay, the cell phone, okay? In the scriptures, the devils that were in the people and the one devil-possessed man who the sons of Sceva were trying to cast out, he said unto the sons of Sceva, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? A good name is rather to be chosen than, riches, than loving riches and uh, than uh, riches and loving favor or something like that. Good name. 
And there is only one name under heaven, under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. One name. That's why when you see these people uh, talking about the names of God, be aware of that heresy. There's only one name given among men under heaven, whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, watch out for that names of God stuff. Okay? See, again, the testimony, beg your pardon, that you are going to be leaving behind. And what a better testimony in your suffering. For they themselves shew of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Look at that, look at that. For they themselves shew of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That these people followed the example given by Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus, that they followed their example. And because they did that and adhered to the scripture, that example was being a testimony. The Lord was using that to glorify himself. Him working through these people. Okay? Like we have already looked at like we have already looked at, that he may be glorified in your flesh because of how you behave in the circumstances of your sufferings. That people, when they say, how can you keep, how can you stay calm? How can you be like that? How can you have such hope and such adversity? How can you sing a hymn when you're writhing in pain? And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Which delivered us, meaning you and I, Church of the Living God, we're not going through the time of Jacob's trouble. We get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble, okay? Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, only one verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one verse. Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2. Come on. Your labor is not in vain. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 on to verse 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. God saves us. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. A new creature. We're made a new creature. And we are called to be ambassadors. Having the a ministry of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation. The gospel. Okay. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Walk your talk. Walk in them. Walk according to the scriptures. It's easy to do when everything is going peachy keen for you, isn't it? How about when you're suffering? Huh? How about when you're sick? Can you still sing a good hymn while sick? Can you say praise the Lord as Job did through all his sufferings and affliction? Hmm? I hope I can. And thus far, knock on wood, 
<laughs> you know? Go to James. James. Remembering about the book of James that James is written unto who? James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. Greeting. Twelve tribes. Israel. Okay? Not the ten that are supposedly in England, you idiots. No. Twelve tribes of Israel. But, James chapter 1, verses 2, 1 verse 7. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers' temptations. Now see, James is written for the Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble. And when the Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble figure it out, that we of the Church of the Living God who believe in the authorized version of the Scriptures were the ones who were truly telling them the truth all along. They're going to understand that because we're not going to be there, of course, because we get caught up. But when they get that, they're going to realize, oh wow, they were telling us the truth all along. They're going to come to Hebrews. They're going to come to James. And James talks about patience here. And they're going to need it because they got to endure it to the end to be saved during the time of Jacob's trouble, which Matthew chapter 24 is about. Okay, so, but we can learn a little something for us today, obviously. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh, come on, patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Wants are many, needs are few. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And of course, verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Unfortunately, I've known quite a few unstable men. Quite a few. But when we're looking at patience, but let patience have her perfect work. James chapter 5, verses 7 on to verse 11. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Second coming he's talking about, obviously. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Again, in context, latter rain is talking about the fulfillment of the Jews. Okay? Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And there's, look, this, James chapter 5 proves to you that this is written for the dispensation of the time of Jacob's trouble. Because the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, the second coming, and these Jews are going to have to endure to the end to be saved. So they need patience. But for us today, for our instruction in righteousness, we need patience, don't we? How are we doing with that? Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. And in personal experience, we both have been through things where we've had to have patience, and at the end of that, just like this verse says, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. 
the Lord can put you through something so horrific, so devastating, but you keep your eyes upon Jesus. And at the end, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. Of tender mercy. And go to Second Peter now, chapter one, verses one on to verse nine. Shimon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. Being separate than that. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity, which is self-sacrifice. For if these things be in you and abound, look at this, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So the question you need to ask yourself Are you diligent? What about virtue? Do you have knowledge? Are you in the scriptures daily? Hmm? What about temperance? Patience. Godliness. How is that in you today? You know... Some of the best ways to acquire all of this is through affliction, through suffering, through trials, through tribulations, through pain, through misery. Because, brethren, when things start going well, how oft can we forget and look down here with level eyes on the playing field and yet neglect to look up. And it doesn't matter what situation you are in, what is happening to you. God can and will use that for his glory. But where are your eyes focused? Do you see the forest for the trees? In 13 years of the Church of the Living God, I've been through a lot in just a mere 13 years. And my wife, recently with what she has been going through has also been learning the same thing that we we read and know it's supposed to be as thus in the scripture but when the lord puts you through it to experience it so that you can learn it 
You get experience. You get hope. You get patience. And it increases your faith. Don't try to uh, shortcut it. And beware of Satan's temptation. Trying to relieve it. When maybe the Lord doesn't want you to. Because remember, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. He has every right to do whatever he wants to do to you. Who are you to say nay? Hi, <laughs> who are ye? Who are you to say nay? I want to see a really good example of this. Just an excellent example of this. Take your pardon, brethren. Here's a really good example of this. Go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verses 19 on to verse 31. Now, this is on the heels of Paul in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, rebuking that spirit of divination who was in that one weird woman who followed them along around in Acts chapter 16, verse 17. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which shew unto us the way of salvation. And yeah, that was true. But this uh, woman that had a spirit of divination was doing that to pester and to annoy. And Paul finally is like, In the name of I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Verse 19. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto their rulers and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceeding trouble, exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. So they were they were gang rushed, stripped naked and whooped, beaten, that kind of stuff, and then just tossed into a prison and then put in shackles, stuff like that. Quite a bit of affliction. And for doing what? Affecting the pocketbook of someone who was using a woman who had a spirit of divination. Soothsaying. Because the word of God, because our Lord through Paul, affected a devil's finances. Then as we just read, they brought him to the magistrates. Like, hey, these are guys are troublemakers. Threw him into prison. Verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Now hold up. After everything they had just gone through. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. See, verse 25 unto my wife and I and to our best friend holds a little bit more meaning to us. Because at midnight, we prayed and we sang praises unto God in that emergency room on the 21st of this month to those prisoners of this world. Under all that affliction. And suddenly. There was a great earthquake. 
so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's hand, bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, waking out of sleep, number one, he was asleep on the job. He shouldn't have done that. Cause for death right there. And seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Because there was all the doors were open. Here's our chance. Let's bolt, right? And the prison guy, the prison guard, the jailer, he was asleep, which should not have been done. That in itself was cause for death. Number two, that he thought everyone was going to escape or had escaped. He was going to kill himself. He was going to kill himself. Because, he, number one, he knew his life was going to be over anyway. Okay? He knew he, was, he, he knew he was a goner. He knew he was a goner. So he was going to beat him to the punch, pretty much. Uh, he was broken. He was to the point where he was willing to kill himself. Why didn't he, why didn't he just run off? Why didn't he just like, oh boy, I better get out of here before things happen. And him himself run and bolt. He could have done that. He could have hightailed it out of there. No, he chose to kill himself. That's brokenness. That's someone who's willing to die in light of certain death, yes, but was willing to die rather than to run off. That's brokenness. The Philippian jailer was broken because of this. Because what he did to Paul and Silas, singing hymns, an earthquake happened, and he was about to kill himself. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. So, he was asleep. And the prison doors were open and all the prisoners were there after the way he uh, treated them. This man, this Philippian jailer, was a broken man. And these devils like, well, there's worldly sorrow, not godly sorrow. Oh, shut up. Just shut up. He was a man at the end of himself. He could have ran off, but he never did. He was a man at the end of himself. He was broken. That's why Paul doesn't mention repentance. Why? Because he was already broken. Okay? Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Why wasn't repentance mentioned there? Because he was already broken. He was a broken man. Why wasn't repentance mentioned onto the eunuch? Uh, he was reading Isaiah chapter 53. He was already a broken man. He was already broken. And if you can read Isaiah 53 and not be broken over that you got some issues boy repentance was already here because this man was broken and they said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house but see what they went through and that witness and testimony that was given through that affliction, through that suffering, after they were beaten, humiliated, put in stocks. And what did they do? Verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. I've heard these, these devil, uh, easy believism heretics well, it says the prisoners. It doesn't say that the jailer heard it.
<laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, God said it right there, buddy. And what happened? The Philippian jailer gets saved. Because he comes, he was broken. And then in that brokenness, Paul told him to believe because he was already broken. Similar onto the Ethiop Ethiopian eunuch. Okay? But see that example through what they went through and singing, uh, um, praying and singing praises unto God affected many. At least the Philippian jailer. And the point is, brethren, you don't know how the Lord is going to use your circumstance that he has put you in. You don't know. Don't lose hope. Don't give yourself over to despair. It's easy to get into despair right now. But who knows what the Lord is going to do with you, through you, through whatever it is he's going to allow you to go through. You don't know. Keep your eyes focused upon our Lord Jesus Christ, dear brethren. Because we walk by faith, not by sight. You might not see an end of your predicament. But walk by faith, not by sight. Because who knoweth what the Lord is going to do? I tell you, brethren, I tell you. <laughs> what me and my wife have been going through lately, oh boy, <laughs> oh boy. So um, that's going to be it for this video. Um, I hope this uh, hopes, I hope this helps, encourages maybe one or two of you. I don't know. Um, Thank you, brethren. Thank you for those of you who do pray for us and keep us in your prayers. We pray for so, so many of you. You know, we don't talk, uh, especially recently, because of what things have been going on with us, um, we've kind of had to withdraw ourselves so we can concentrate on things, you know, with my wife. Had to really just like, okay, need to, need to, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a husband, and I need to take care of my wife. And uh, taking care of her right now has, means a lot, means a lot. And that, as a servant, I'm supposed to serve God, but also serve my wife as the weaker vessel. So, um, thank you for all of you who have kept us in your prayer. And please continue to pray for us. We, uh, it ain't going to get easier. But you know, brethren... Whatever situations we're going to go through, the Lord can and will use that for his glory if you keep your eyes upon our Lord Jesus Christ. And don't fall for Satan's devices to try to distract you. But let patience have her perfect work. Oh, I know that's hard. I know. Keep your eyes upon Jesus, brother. That's going to be it for this video. We love you. Brethren, pray for one another. Pray for the sick. Pray for the babes in Christ Jesus. Pray for our brothers and sisters in Australia. Wow. Wow. In Australia, if we, if we were in Australia and this happened to my wife... Unless we had the steel of the Jesuit poniard, they wouldn't even see us. That's coming here to America, too, by the way. Pray for our brethren in Australia. And uh, it's going to be a pretty busy week for us. Uh, got uh, quite a few, Lord willing, videos to do. So... Um, Thank you, brethren. We love you. And we will see you in the next video.